everybody, if there's kids out there watching this, I want to make it very clear that I'm not here saying go out there and try dangerous stuff. The point of this video here, the message is that if you have a passion and you want to... When, when you've got a passion and you can have something that's going to give you the strength to get through it, no matter what it is, you've got to use it. And Mike, you've done that so well. Sitting here, as you can see them, and all the bleachers on this side as well. So, here we go. This is your mic. How you doing, brother? You did a great job. Everybody, give it up for Mike. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I've been dreaming of doing this for really 16 years. I started doing walls of fire 16 years ago. This is the first time I've done it in eight years. I said I wasn't going to do it again, and I got a phone call. And I get to come do it, and some of the people I've known my whole life are going to get to see it till now. Dude, that's right. Lifelong friends and an honorary member of the Starbird family, Evil Midget, tell us a little bit, because if you guys didn't know, Mike was just in a big movie. We saw him. He was in Killers of the Flower Moon, and if you didn't see him, you got to watch it again. Yeah, I was in Killers of the Flower Moon. I've been on Monster Garage, America's Got Talent, uh, American Daredevils. I've done a lot of stuff. At one time, I actually held the record for Walls of Fire. I really wanted to tell everybody, the Starbirds, Christy, Cliff, Bryce, um, thank you guys so much. And camera is. And also, my crew. I couldn't have done this without Chris, Matt, Nate, all the dudes over there. Every single one of those guys. Give them a hand. I get the easy part. I just try not to fall. <laughs> I gotta say, man, that was just brilliant. <laughs> that was brilliant. It happened very quick. I didn't expect it. Yeah, I knew it's bad. But I caught it, and it's you guys saw It's pretty much like my whole life. It's on it. And you broke the walls. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was just going to be like, I, like I said to you earlier, I'm thinking ring of fire, so I thought, okay, walls of fire. Yeah. But you actually broke through those wooden planks that were on fire. Yeah. Okay, enough of me talking. How do you feel? I am so relieved. This has been months of talking to my guys talking to the starboard, worrying about fire marshals and stuff. We pulled it off. Like, we did it. And it, it looked it. good. Like, everybody loved it. I just, I don't even know, man. I haven't felt, I'm going to turn chunky. And I've been playing pretty well for the last eight years. I've done some hard racing and some, like, Nothing like this. Like this is, this is. I've got that. We can all see it on your face, you know, the music's coming on, so but we can see it on your face. You're thriving! <laughs> You're as strong with adrenaline! I, yeah, that was, it went so well. Like, it went... Those planks just blew off, and I'm going to keep showing you guys and show you in slow motion as well. They just broke off, and it was just, it was amazing. <laughs> Thank you! And I think the crowd should be thanking you because that was quite a show. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, let's have a chat with Steve and Kim Cook. You guys, thank you so much for doing this with me. I am fascinated with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knows anyone better than their own parents. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. So. Maybe. <laughs> he's got some friends that know him better yeah. than I do. <laughs> he may have a few friends that he's done things we probably don't know about. <laughs> Mike is an absolute burst of energy. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've seen him a few times in other settings. Okay. And now that I've actually interacted with him, he's an absolute character. Mm -hmm. He draws people in. Mm -hmm. He's laughing, he's joking, he's cracking jokes. And I thought to myself, wow, okay, it's, it's an inspiration for so many other people out there doing something or wanting to do something new and who've got some difficulties with it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get your guys, you two in here, and um, just ask a little bit about, as he was growing up, his childhood. So tell me about some of the difficulties he had when he was born. Um, he was born with the SED congenital dwarfism which is a spinal type dwarfism. It's not like the achondroplasia where they have the more average sized body with the shorter arms and legs. He has a shorter body with longer arms and legs. And so he's, it's not something that he would, in a achondroplasia would always have a chance of having more achondroplasia children in their genetic makeup, but okay. with his, it's more like just a birth defect. It's not something that he would always, he would continue on. If he had children, he would probably have average size children is what they told us. Michael always told me that he thought I would like doing psychology, or not doing it, but going to school to learn about it. I think everybody would love it. Yeah. It just is so fascinating to learn about your own behavior and the personalities mm -hmm. and how we react and just every aspect, whether it's your finger or your hand or your feet and the way you stand, mm -hmm. it's, everything has a message and not only from the person giving it but also from the person receiving it and mm -hmm. how they're receiving things influenced by stuff that's happened in their past right. is very different to somebody else receiving that exact same. I've always liked to study personalities, and some of that has to do with how you were raised. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I can see how you think Michael turned out. Oh. Well, how did Michael turn out this way? What did you guys have in the influence? And maybe it was just... It's just because of who you are. I don't know that it was anything we did. I did like I said, I do think he took after my dad a lot, but... Uh, you know, I'm sure Daddy had an influence on his life. My father-in-law had an influence on his life. He's stubborn, kind of redneck type person. Oh, and, I don't know what. Yeah. And I think Michael learned from that. You know, like I'm going to do it my way. And my dad was kind of that way too. You know, so I think he learned a lot from his grandparents. I think the comedian part of him. <laughs> I don't think of me as a comedian. He's kind of a comedian, but he doesn't always say funny things in front of uh, strangers. So it was more in our house type thing, you know, and then they got to where they give each other a hard time and, you know, back and forth. But anyway, I well, think that's where he got the sense of humor from <laughs> maybe was from Steve. Yeah, Steve, you're a very humble man. <laughs> you are. You know, we are, obviously this is Rana's radar and we like to do interviews on cars and I love it when builders get in there and just tell us everything. So when I was chatting with Steve about um, the Impala, again, congratulations, it was just like, oh no, not really. And you know, you it's a huge achievement, but you are very humble. Well, I think I think that ought to come with the territory. I think once you see the scope of, and you meet all the people and, and uh, how diverse we are and how talented some of the people are and everything, it's you're, you're, you're just awe-struck and inspired to be a part of it. Not, I, I mean, I'm just, I enjoy, I think my biggest learning curve was just being able to see, the mind's a wonderful thing, and if you can go and see that stuff and experience it and, and just be able to take time to just digest that maybe. Um, 
the mind's a wonderful thing. It is. I love that. And I guess, you know, in many ways you would have seen that in Michael as well. Yeah. I think, I think that, you know, anything's possible. You know, I, I had a guy one time tell me that I didn't look like a car builder. And we've been talking about that some. <laughs> what does weekend. a car builder look like? Exactly. We, we always <laughs> joke about that. Like, you don't look like a car. I would tell him that. You've seen I, a lot I'm of them. I'm fascinated now. Yeah. I'm, well, that's it. I have met many car builders now, many yeah. old, young, and yes. they look all different ways. I, I'm trying to think, like, what is... <laughs> yeah, could you draw me that picture or take a, show me that picture? <laughs> I would love to see what... Okay, go on. <laughs> well, I just... You know, I just, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, from racing and doing things, and just my take on it was that that's you just learn to live in your own lane, do your own thing, and if you follow somebody too much, you, you're never going to get ahead. And it's not that I'm really trying to get ahead anywhere. I think that, uh, I, I think I do. I'm like Mike, maybe to a point. Maybe that's where he gets some of that. I have a desire for people to. I think I'm really misunderstood, but I don't know how to, how to apply that anywhere but I found that I can do it through cars so I think if there's any and you're making me think way too hard but if there's <laughs> any any ingredient in there somewhere that's the deal it's just trying to maybe see somebody can see a window through my windows and see what I'm trying to portray or something I it's not about me D did you ever see that in Michael as he was growing up that he may be um, struggling to express himself oh sure he still is I think, think we all are. Okay. Yeah, I think we all are. Yeah, I think we'll we'll do that every day we're on this planet, for some reason or another. You know, want people to understand why we're passionate about things and why we do things. And I think, I mean, I just, I think that's part of the reason we're on this planet. So maybe everybody else can can see that. Maybe maybe that does inspire. I see so many different things that that inspire me. You know, and and I don't think some of the people even realize that. But uh, we were just watching the kids ride on the the big monster truck yeah and just how they react they, they were overwhelmed you know we're thinking oh there's going to be their grandfather was taking them up there and <laughs> you know when that thing fires up you know and there's that's all when you listen to somebody getting a lifetime achievement war here last night of what how the simplest thing changed the trajectory of their life mm -hmm. like riding in a monster truck yeah. or something you know, you know like you talk to tim strange or anybody that, that and it, that's inspiring. I love hearing those stories, you know, just like you. I mean, Absolutely. that's what, yeah, it's just, it. you know, and it's fun to, to to hear all that. I could sit all day and listen to people's stories, you know, so. Absolutely. And this is exactly the reason why we are here right now. And I wanted to get you guys on film because what Mike is doing is very inspiring. Mm -hmm. It would be inspiring for people out there who had no difficulties at all. Mm -hmm. But for him, from his background and from where he has come from, mm -hmm. for doing what he does, and loving it mm -hmm. and thriving in it and being successful in it it's um it's something that it just really needs to get out there and this is why i wanted to do this exclusive and show you guys so you can not only meet mike as well but also meet the parents <laughs> and see some of the stuff as well as um, do your own research and have a look at some of the documentaries movies and other stuff he's all over the internet you have to have a look at it but it's like you said steve when someone does something to inspire other people, that's an achievement on its own. I think Whether they do it one time or many, many times. You asked me what, what I thought about all of it. I think the thing I take away from it, he had so much help, so many people there in his corner, set up the deal, help him build the deal, and that's the thing he gives me a hard time. Is like, you can't do it all. And then watching him do all that, and, and he... You know, those people just, you know, he's not paying those people to do all that stuff. Yeah. And, and, uh, but they're his friends. Yes. And they want to help him. They go the extra, you know, they just, they want to be a part of it. They come all the way up here to help him. And some of them are already going to be here. But just seeing that happen kind of makes you feel good about where he's at and what he's doing. Absolutely. That, you know. I know when he was little, he'd go to therapy a lot. <laughs> and it didn't matter. He was always such a happy kid. It didn't matter what he had to go through, he would still be smiling in the end, you know. And I think that that's, yeah, that helped me a lot. Because it was hard as a parent to take him to those therapies yes. and things, you know, that yes. I knew they were going to make him do certain stuff. And sometimes I felt like I was fighting battles against doctors. Not all doctors. Some doctors were good. Some doctors I wondered about. <laughs> And so, you know, I felt like I was always 
fighting for him, you know. And so, but well, then, you were a mom, so. But then you knew he had to go through some things no yes. matter what. <laughs> but he was always just happy, even though he had gone through it. You know, he didn't sulk or anything. And, he, you know, his buddies would come over. We had a big yard, and uh, he started, his grandparents bought him a BMX bicycle. And he was so much smaller than the other kids, but he would go out there and race on that BMX track. I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, and everybody cheered him on. You well, know, he did and that. he always got he, last. Yeah, he raced, you know. And, <laughs> and there was a man I never really met. I, I mean, I met him, but I didn't really know him. Yeah. That sponsored, sponsored him, him. Gave him a jersey so he'd fit in with all these other kids. Yeah. Even though he was always getting well, last. Of, even though his his grandma or grandparents could buy him things, these other kids that this man sponsored couldn't afford, their parents couldn't afford it. So he sponsored underprivileged kids, but he wanted Michael to be in his group. So my mother-in-law made sure he got in the group. <laughs> she was like... She Grandma was, to the rescue. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She was something else, his mom. But, you <laughs> know, Mike could figure out how to fit in different groups. You know, yeah. that's that's... Probably been one of his best cards. He's, he's been able to fit in yeah. anyway. Yeah. Unlike and me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. Well, he never minded being the center of attention. He's never minded that. And he's just turned that around and used it so positively. Mm -hmm. It's made a brand of mm -hmm. something that other people would shy away from talking mm -hmm. and um, having it out there. But he's just used it. He's like, yep, this is who I am. This is what I have. I and when he first got into Monster Garage, he he was just on MySpace. Do you remember I remember MySpace. My yep. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't ever on it, but he was. And so, a little people's organization for our local chapter okay. in Oklahoma, and then uh, the national chapter. And we would take him to those events. Mm -hmm. Well, I think taking him to those events, we started taking him to those when he was like five, and I. Would, we would just go every other year because we couldn't afford to take him every year. But mm -hmm. my in-laws and my mom and stuff would help us make sure we could take him there, you yeah. know. And then um, when he, you when you go to an event like that, you see all kinds of little people, and he would see what they were all doing. Yep. And you know, he would just get out there and dance because when you would go to their dances. They didn't care, you know. They were all out there just dancing and having a good time, and and then they would have special types of Olympics and stuff, you know, at that little, little I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it was little sports events, yep. you know, that was a, they were able to do for, for their for their um, uh, height and stature. Yeah. yeah, and so they he's he's been around all that and seen, and he has friends that are. Little people, he doesn't necessarily hang out with them, but uh, some of them, since they were kids, you know, little kids, you know, he's known them. And so he, I think he's been an inspiration even to some of their kids. Yes. Because he would. Yeah, because now they got kids, so. Yeah, and so when he would go to an event, which he hasn't been to a little people's event, well, that I know of, but uh, they, they would call him Michael. You know, our kids want to meet you or something because yeah. they maybe they saw him on TV. But when he went to, this, so when he was on this MySpace, uh, some men that were also on MySpace that were uh, little people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, there was a, a little person on Jesse James's show Monster Garage that was their parts runner. Okay, he did their parts, uh, uh, went and got parts for him and stuff. Well. Body Drop started uh, contacting other little people and asking them if they would do a build. Well, mm -hmm. they did a little people's build. Michael wasn't involved in, and it did. They didn't finish it. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the show, if you didn't finish your car, they blew it up. So on Monster Garage. <laughs> yes. So, so, but if you did finish your car, they gave you a toolbox full of tools. Matt nice. Tools uh, sponsored it. So, they, Body Drop wanted to do another 
build, but he wanted to do a mini truck because this mm -hmm. was in the early 2000s. So yeah, they they uh, did a lot of mini trucks back then. You know, uh, that was popular. So it's popular again now. <laughs> yeah, it is becoming popular again. I noticed that. <laughs> so he contacted some guys. Well, some guys had heard about Michael mm -hmm. through that MySpace that he worked at our shop, and he had a 62. Cadillac, we'd painted pink for him. Okay. And so that was I have his, to ask him about that. You will. It was his daily driver at the time. And uh, had the biggest car at the shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, and at that time I was working full time doing body work for him, so I would have him pull it back there. He had a couple of little dents in it, not anything major, but uh -huh. so I would. While I was working on another car, I'd go out there. I'd bump it out. Pull it. Well, I'd just have him pull up by the door and I'd sand on it. I don't, I don't buff. I don't, I don't do much finish work. No. I did all the work up to paint. Okay. So more hand sanding. More hand stuff. sanding. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm learning the process yeah, and the steps. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what I would have him do is pull his car up there. And tr I was trying to sand it down and get it ready for paint. Yeah. So that he could shoot it and. He wanted that Pepto Bismol pink on there. Oh my gosh, I'm not a pink person. So well, we're anyway. gonna have to ask him exactly why. Was it? <laughs> but I love it the because women. maybe well the women and also to be different, yeah, yes, to stand out, to be different, yeah. and that's a huge part of his but personality and character him, that I'm understanding. If you ask him why he puts anything on the car, he has a station wagon with this major metal flake in the flames. Okay. <laughs> it's because it's a woman magnet. It's a woman magnet. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't she say that? I don't know. He might word it differently. But <laughs> I don't know what it <laughs> I've heard We'll him let him say, say it. it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. But anyway, so he he's always just wanted to be the center of attention. But when he got on that month, when he did finally, somebody contacted him and they did this little person's build. They were able to finish the build or whatever, and he got his toolbox and all that. But I think the camera people, he was so expressive on the show. And, you know, they're tired. They've worked long hours, and Michael's getting frustrated, and mm -hmm. he's expressing himself, and maybe a little more than, <laughs> you know, I told him. I told him, just try not to cuss a lot, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on national TV, but anyway, so he, I think they fed off of that, fed on him, I don't know how to explain it, they kind of antagonized him mm -hmm. more than the others because... They of, knew they would get a reaction. Exactly, and so also they told him that they thought he was really good and that he could do this more often. I mean, you know, so I think that was a big step in him starting to do the stuff with Trigger Gum and Travis when he did the video. And I think you can still find that on YouTube. I'm sure you can. Uh, the <laughs> video where they were doing the tribute because Johnny Knoxville was on there. It was for, it was for uh, Jack Well, I I give him a hard time at the shop because he, he does bring some drama sometimes. And yes. I'm not too... He overreacts sometimes. But he says, I'm an actor and I get paid for it. Oh, well, <laughs> now he can definitely <laughs> use that, right? Yeah. <laughs> now that he's gone Hollywood, honestly. Yeah, and exactly. He, and you know, he's always had a headshot and um, people that, I guess, people that try to find him jobs or mm -hmm. whatever through... The agents, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, some kind of agent. And so... He's had that since he was young. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's been times when he felt like it was kind of slowing down or whatever, but then he got into doing that walls of fire. I don't, I don't know He's he had so many that. odd jobs doing. He, he, he knew, and you guys knew as well from a young age, that he was going to make a mark in the world for himself. Yeah. People I were going to know so. him. I People think, were going to know him. I don't think I realized how much they would do. Yeah, I think I'm still amazed. I yeah. mean, I really am. <laughs> you still waiting to see what is he going to I mean, when you next? go over there and you're talking to Bobby Alloway and he's got one of Michael's midget approved stickers on his toolbox or <laughs> something, you know, you're like, seriously? <laughs> well, I, I'm a midget approved as well now. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, that's just from my point, you know. I'm like, <laughs> he'll be trying to see. He's got one on her car and I'm like, well, Dan Duffy's car here has got one in the window. 
There you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people like that. You know, Dan's a super good guy, and, mm -hmm. and he supported Michael. I hear him. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll go in there and give Mike a hard time. Who are you on the phone with? And then it's Dan. I'm like, oh, he's okay. a great guy, you know. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> go I'll go on. back to work. <laughs> but, well, um, this has been awesome. <laughs> I appreciate your time and taking us down memory lane <laughs> with Mike. <laughs> You know, it's always fun, and I'm glad I chose not to have Mike in this interview because then we could all have all spoken freely. And yes. by we, I mean you too. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's probably heard all of it a little bit before at some point, but if we could have got a word in it twice. Well, I, and that's the other thing as well. So <laughs> that's why I wanted to do this, and I'm so glad that I did because now I've gotten to know Mike so much more. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I was fascinated and honestly it wasn't even the dwarfism or anything like that at all but I've just seen him do all this different stuff and I've seen him at the shows and I'm like okay well I'm chasing these key figures that are such a big part of the hot rod world mm -hmm. and um, of just the racing the wheels. Well he's doing things I, I would never be able to do you know. So mm -hmm. I've always wanted to you know and, and coincidentally it is a by absolute coincidence that we are talking about Mike, because Steve is where I come in. I message mm -hmm. yourself and Mike controls the social media mm -hmm. part. So I said, you know, I want to come over and have a look at the shop and have a look at the Impala as well. He's like, well, you know, this is, um, this is Mike, Steve's son. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> so then I put the two and two together because I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea. I think that gives him the freedom to working at the shop. To take off and go and do whatever, yeah. but he doesn't have a lot of benefits as far as medical and stuff. Well, see, my dad accused me of not having a real job, <laughs> so I think Mike's even taking it to another level. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's 2024. That's okay. I yeah. technically don't have a real job either with benefits. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but that's okay, you that's know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I work at Tinkers. I keep the benefits for yeah. Steve. And she I. told me that when I turn 50, I'm getting a real job. Yeah. Well, it's a bit, I mean, me and my husband don't have a real job because he runs a gym. So yeah. no one's going to pay him the benefits unless he pays himself. So. That's, right. that's right. But that's life. And um, well, we were younger and healthier when I was working at the shop with him. And I still enjoy doing the work and helping him. Yep. It's just there's not enough hours in the day to work out there and help To do him. everything. And I used to do his book work, but he... Uh, well, Michael, as he got older, he has some issues with, um, what was that on his elbows? I don't know. Spurs on his elbows. Oh, spurs, yep. And stuff. So a lot of what we do at the shop is sand on cars. We don't oh, use any power equipment. Cool. We yeah. do it all by hand. Yeah. We're so, going to talk more about that when we do our <laughs> interview with Steve so, Hawk and some so of the work. <laughs> it just got harder and harder for him to help out in the shop. And uh, because it was harder on his body. Yes. And I had been asking him because I was working some overtime out at Tinker because it was required. And coming home and trying to do the book work at night to help him. And so. I don't run a business, I just work on cars. You all are the same. If you don't have the supportive wives, the lights you will you. be off. Absolutely. It's every shop that I've been to is the same story. Yeah. I call it keeping the lights on, which you Yeah. Really do. <laughs> so, Michael, Michael finally took over the book work. I still do the payroll, but he does all the accounts and payables and billing and everything. So I taught him to do all that and he, he's doing great. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to get Mike on here now. So I hope you guys have enjoyed getting to know a little bit about parents, but let's get Evil Midget on the screen and see what he has to say. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Michael Cook, Evil Midget Team, right here, man. How's it going? How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much. And welcome to Rana's Radar. Yeah, this is awesome. This is awesome. You know, we've got the noise in the background. You saw some of Mike's stuff there in the intro. 
I hope that my voice and everything can come through because we wanted to create the atmosphere. This is like, this is Evil Midget, right? Yeah, right? this is me. I mean, one thing about the Starbirds, it's noisy all the it's time. Noisy. But you see so much, and it's all inside, it's all right here. You don't really have to, it's all contained. Like, yep. if you get bored here, you're just bored. No, you definitely won't be bored here. Now, we're here at the Daryl Starbird Car Show, everybody. These beautiful classics, high end customs, amazing rat rod, hummers, and then we've got the Evil Knievel exhibit, which is where we're sitting here right now. Tell me about your connection with them, and more importantly, they've endorsed you. So, the Knievels have endorsed me. It was kind of a funny thing that I had a friend take my helmet and put Evil Midget on the helmet. So I went and took it to Butte and showed the Knievels and they said, you know what, we like you. And so it's a little bit longer story than that. But well, that, is, that is a huge, I mean, congratulations. It, it, it's a huge deal. That is a huge deal. And then from doing stunts and getting to perform at Evil Days, I met White a lot of the people that are involved with the Knievels throughout all the years. And so Whiteman is the main guy behind the museum in Topeka. Yep. And so that's kind of how all this stuff comes to play. So when I was doing a, a documentary thing with them, they told me about this traveling museum. And I said, you got to go to Starbucks. So I got it booked. And as part of that, We've been, the Starbirds and I have been trying to do that start for years, years. many I years, heard. and I mean, I've been retired for eight years before I came back yesterday, but finally, it happened. And it happened brilliantly. And it did. It happened brilliantly, you know, when you first said to me, you're going to go through a wall of fire. I'm thinking, okay, just one wall. It wasn't just one wall, everybody. It was five walls. Five. Five walls of fire, and it was done after eight years. You know, again, Mike, how were you feeling before when you were putting your helmet on and you're getting ready? <laughs> no, it was one of those. It was nerve wracking, wasn't it? So, you know, I've been to motorcycles since I was nine years old. I knew I had that part down. I hadn't really written one much in eight years. But I knew I had that part. It was having everybody on point, the fire looking good, and not burning the place down, not sliding out. And then it's, a it's lot so of cool and to get to do it cool. in front of like, my parents. You know, people who with the Knievel stuff, the Starbirds that are like family to me. Like, there's so many people here at this show that are like my family. They're like, and they I were here cried. to support you. I almost cried. It the crowd cool. loved it. It was absolutely epic. You know, Mike's parents are going to be joining us very soon as well. So we'll have a chat with them to get to know him because, Mike, you're an absolute personality. <laughs> you know, you've been doing this for such a long time. What is your earliest memory of wanting to get involved with stunts? And uh, stunts, that kind of, when I was a kid, I would build my my friends stunts to do because I understood the dynamics how it worked. I basically got dared to do something <laughs> and it was like, alright, let's do it. And that's how the walls of and fire. That's came how the about. daredevil was born. Yeah, and wow. so I've always kind of pushed the edge because you know my cousins race, my uncles race, everybody got to race motorcycles for me. Yeah. This was my way to be able to be a professional motorcycle rider. And not just the professional motorcycle stuff, man. Now, so you've done some awesome stuff that has gotten you well recognition, a lot of fame in a whole genre of different things. And now you're in Hollywood. I am. <laughs> but we can't jump straight to that. You know, I want to take you guys back to Jackass. Now, who remembers Jackass? I do. I was really young, but I know that Jackass was always playing on my TV because my brothers loved it. <laughs> You were on Jackass, and tell me about your time there. So, 
In 2007, Evil passed away. At that time, every once in a while, I would help my friend Trigger Gum do stunts. He held the world record for the longest motorcycle jump for a while, 277 feet. So, he says, hey, we're filming this tribute in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and your buddy Guy Cooper's in it, and all of these people you know are in it. Come help me try to set a world record. When Trigger calls, I go. Of course. <laughs> so, all I'm really doing is measuring wind and speed and stuff like that. I'm not actually supposed to be doing anything other than help him. Well, I ran into Travis Pastrana, which we had met when we were kids. He raced against my cousin okay. in mini bikes. Okay. And a little bit as an adult. So Travis goes, dude, I remember you ride, you know how to ride a motorcycle. Yeah. Because you want to do it your first backflip you've never been done. And I'm like, well, if anybody's going to do it. I want to try and put that backflip image or the footage over this so you guys can have a look as yeah. well. Hopefully YouTube allows it. But that backflip was epic, you know. It's, I, I mean, you, that was the first time you did it. That was the only time I did it. You, you never did a backflip again after that? No. Wow, okay. I, mean, I got you, like you made it look so easy. And, <laughs> so like, after the flip, you see me talking, I can't see anybody in front of me. What happened? I got whiplash so bad that I lost my vision for a little while. I did not know that. Wow, okay. You can't even tell. I mean, and then later that day, I got on Trigger's bike with him and jumped 113 feet and clapped some vertebrae and then just went to the after party like no big deal. So when did you notice that your vision was gone? Immediately. It only lasted about 15 minutes. Wow. So that's all I'm like, I can it understand. It wasn't totally gone. You know that line in your mind that tells you up and down? I saw that line. Everything up was blue, everything down. I, if I wanted to look at you, I had to look like this. You know, Mike, you're an absolute character, and that's why I had a chat with your parents. The thing that I love most about it is not your stunts. Your stunts are awesome. But what fascinates me is you liven up the room, and, you know, everywhere that you walk, we can just feel it. You've got such an energy. It's an inspiration for people out there wanting to do stunts, and also people who've had difficulties because, so you have... It, it would never appear to anybody that you would have had any kind of a difficulty or not, but you did because I spoke to your parents and they would have felt and they would have known right. you, know, you were such a happy child. That's one thing that sometimes it seems odd because me and my dad do work together. We don't always get along. But, you know, my dad never really, you know, my mom, like, never treated me much different than anybody else. So instead of kind of, for lack of words, baby, it was just, you're going to do it, you do it. Like, I wanted to ride a motorcycle really bad. You know, when you're little and they have them bills and you write what you want to be when you grow up, the first thing I ever wanted to be was a motorcycle, professional motorcycle. Cross racer. You just wanted to be on a bike. Yeah, you because that's what everybody bike. in my family did was either drag race or yeah. race dirt bikes. And so, like, it broke my heart for a long time that I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. And once I started, my dad told me, I'm not going to pay for you to race. I'm nine years old. And he's like, if you want to race, you have to do it. And I figured out ways to do it. I ended up racing at the AMA uh, pit bike finals in Vegas twice. Wow. I mean, because to me, it doesn't matter if I get first or last. Like, being there is what I enjoy. You were persistent, and your passion was so strong. You just, you persevered through it. And I think that's what's most inspiring to a lot of people, and that's why it has to be known. We're going to talk about the records that Mike has broken, as well as the latest Hollywood film that he's going to be in. But more than that, your whole journey through life, you've done it with a big, fat smile, a joke <laughs> or two, and amongst good company. And I just absolutely love it because it's, you need to inspire other people out there, whether it's other little people or anybody else who would have been born abnormally, that, you know what, you can have a heck of a life. You know, there's some days that I'm at home and I'm not feeling it. 
And I'm like, you did all this for nothing. So I'll call up one of my buddies. They usually figure out pretty quick when I'm down. Because they'll try to joke with me on text or something. And I'm just like, yeah, whatever. And they're like, get dressed. Meet me over here. And usually we're done about 30 minutes. So just start pulling up old pictures. Dude, go through your phone for exactly. two minutes. Take a look at the line. Yeah, and I'm like, all right. Like, or they'll show me something where somebody shared something on social media. Like, get to do this with you. Yeah. Like, I was telling my buddy the other day. I mean, he's a lot older. He's closer to my parents. And I was like, who would have thought we would be right here 20 years ago? And he's like, dude, you've done it. You're doing good. And I'm like, my, my back pocket don't tell me that, but <laughs> well, I feel it. You know, so many things has pushed you through it, and nothing helps a stuntman, a showman, and a daredevil to keep going than breaking a record. Tell me about it. So... When I did the backflip with Travis, that was the first ever thing I had ever done that was a record-breaking thing. Uh, then, like, you know, when it came time for my dad to do Detroit, that was record-breaking for us. Yeah. Then it was for him. I mean, to me, it was just a car show, but it was cool. <laughs> Um, then doing as I got to do more the very next thing I did after that was I wanted to be the first little person midget, whatever to jump over a car so I went to my friends we totally set it up in the middle of a flat track motorcycle race I jumped over a truck so that my like, it was a small truck his truck and then you set the record then it was okay now you're gonna do walls of fire which was made we just wanna do this yeah I got a Honda 50 let's do it and once I did so many walks people started hey you should go more and more and then it got and that's all you needed to hate then I started getting texts hey you know all we can find is where somebody did 13 once you did 15 then I got it in my mind okay I found one where somebody had done 15 or 16 and I was like I'm going to bed so I went to a local promoter in Oklahoma City my buddy Max he's called me two or three times to make sure I'm good today I love that dude so he says, well, I'm putting on a deal in downtown Oklahoma City. You build the walls, I'll make it happen. So I built 21 walls. 21. We had a hard time keeping the flame lit. So what you got to do, I learned, is piss off all your friends right before the stunt so they'll make the fire bigger. Because if they like you, they're going, man, I don't want to burn it. <laughs> So you piss them all off and then tell them to go like the woods. Man, you're an absolute hurt. I swear, you're an absolute hurt. I broke the record, called Guinness, got it all lined out, and they said, ah, we don't accept that to get us book records. So I called Spanky Spanklers, good buddy of mine, great guy. And I said, Spanky, what do I do? He goes, you want to know the truth? Yeah, he goes, don't waste your time and money. He goes, I say that you broke the record. To me, that's it. And I said, you know what? Spanky Spanky says you have the record, you have the record. There you go. <laughs> and still today, if I call him, he goes, what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, thinking about doing more walls of fire. He goes, stop. <laughs> you have the record and you know it. You've got the record and you know it. But no matter what anybody says, stopping is not really in your vocabulary much these days. Yeah. You've, uh, you've expanded and you're getting your hands into a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Tell me some of your latest achievements. So, as far as video-wise goes... Well, we knew that you've always been into... You've always been behind the camera. Yeah. Monster's Garage was huge. And... That was my first big thing was Monster Garage. Yes. Then it turned in, in with the stunt stuff, which the Jackass tribute to evil. Then it was American Daredevil. Then... My buddy Will Posey called me a big oak garage. I'm sure you guys heard him. He was a good guy's trendsetter, one touch yep. of the year. Uh, he's here 
Five nine with the Cadillac. He called and he and I were on riding your life with Courtney Hanson on motor train. From that, during the middle of that, I got a call to go do Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro. I absolutely love both of them. That is huge. I mean, Ride of Your Life is big as well. So to have Courtney come out with you and Will from Big Oak Garage, and then you get a call from Hollywood. It's taking it to the next level. Tell us about the movie, and more importantly, tell us about your role. So, what a lot of people don't know is when they do casting calls for that, it is very, very, very specific. So they wanted a little person for the still. So I sent it in, thinking I'll never do this. Like there's a million people. Well, it was kind of toward the end of COVID, and a lot of people with disabilities they don't want to be out in the public. Me, I got super depressed because of that because I love being out and about. <laughs> we know. <laughs> so I actually opened up my house to be a speakeasy. <laughs> so um, I get the call. Yeah. So I go and I tell all the show producers, and then now they're all in on it. Dude, it's a Martin Scorsese movie. You gotta go. So I, it just so happened they had moved this show to May instead of in February. Yeah. So I stopped by here on the way to go do the uh, test shoots for it. Wow, because the movie is filmed here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, everybody. A part of it, which is just north of here. A part of it, okay. And you were by coincidence yeah. here at that time. Okay, go on. I'm trying so to I go up there, and at that time I had a full beard. Okay. For the one time in my life I had one. They shaved it completely off, no sideburns or anything. Uh, so as the capital gets off the train, I walk and hand him a flyer, and I'm hollering, make it rich, make it rich. And he just kind of looks at me, and I just keep walking. It's a moment in a movie where, you know, there are some moments in certain movies that get remembered more than the entire movie, right? And I feel like that could be a moment as well. That could be. I got just for just talking about it. I want to see if I can express myself. Now, I have seen the part, okay? So, it's just, it's, we have certain memories of certain movies and um, there is, um, how should I say this, uh, not statements, but, you know. Um, Scenes. Scenes and uh, sayings, you know, somebody says something and you remember that and everybody just always says it. This could be one of those. So all I did <laughs> was go back to my days of when I would hand out flyers to bands. And I'd be like, hey, come see this band or whatever I was doing. Yeah. Because in the 20s, they didn't have TVs really to do all these commercials or internet or any of that. So you're just handing out flyers. And I got to talking to DiCaprio about the train that they had actually shipped in to Paul Esco where we shot our scene. And we got to talking about hot rods, and how he owns a Duesenberg, blah, blah, blah. I restored a Duesenberg when I was in high school with my dad. Just, yeah. And then after it was all said and done, the whole casting people, all of them loved me. So when I'm filming this, the camera guy, one has a camera, like a big camera. The other guy has this crazy controller. They have to walk backwards, and I have to walk between them. There's not much space, so they're gonna step on me. One of them, one of the two of them, is gonna step on me. So the guy with the least expensive stuff, I actually shoved him into the train and kept going, and it made the captain real laugh. We had to reset it and do it again. <laughs> wow, fully on set. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And so what? then I like freaked out because I'm like, oh man, this costs a lot and I don't need to be wasting her time. And the captain comes over and he goes, dude, that was funny. He goes, you're good, don't worry about it. That's why we do multiple takes. I'm like, all right, cool. When it was said and done, this is the best part of it. They all told me bye. Martin Scorsese made me go in his little office and congratulated me and thanked me for being in the movie. That was I'm more proud of that than anything. It's such an achievement and it's another one in the books for you. It's another one in the books, you know. Not only have you broken records and I've been in such memorable shows that people will always remember. And you've been on America's Got Talent. Uh, there was 
the bus involved. Jump. So we stood two buses up like this and then jumped the bus into them and knocked them over. You love the adrenaline. You call yourself, you told me, an adrenaline junkie. True. Oh. We saw it live. Uh, yeah, yesterday. By the time it was over, I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Have a look at the scene here. This is Mike when he came straight after the job. Brilliant. It happened very quick. I didn't expect it. Yeah, I knew it's bad. But I caught it and it's you guys saw It's pretty much saw like it. my whole life. It's on it. And you broke the walls. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was just going to be like, I, like I said to you earlier, I'm thinking ring of fire. So I thought, okay, walls of fire. Oh. But you actually broke through those wooden planks that were on fire. Uh -huh. Okay, enough of me talking. How do you feel? I am so relieved. This has been months of talking to my guys, talking to the starboard, worrying about fire marshals and stuff. We pulled it off, like we did it, we and it, off, it looked it. good, like everybody loved it, I just don't even know, man, I haven't felt, I'm going to turn chunky, and I've been playing pretty well for the last eight years, I've done some hard racing and some, like, but nothing like this, like this is, this is, I forgot that, we could all see it on your face, you know, the music's coming on, so but we can see it on your face. You're flying! <laughs> You're with that treadmill. You know, so it's... Is there something that you really want to do, but you feel like you can't? Or that you haven't done yet, or it's in the works? For the last eight years that I wasn't doing Daredevil stuff, I kind of went idle a little bit, just doing TV stuff, working more at the shop. You know, uh, when I'm at the shop, I run all the bookkeeping side of it and all the office side of it. And I order everything, and, yeah. you know, whatever. So I put a lot more focus into that. But eventually, I want to have a major role in a movie. That's my ultimate goal. Okay. I got that taste. It's like eating the best steak in the world, but I only got to have a bite. <laughs> I want the whole damn thing. You enjoyed it. You loved the whole production, the crew. I loved the every hustle minute and hustle. Of it. Wow. You know, like the personal assistant, the all that, like. The fact that I get one sometimes is like, well, wow. You know what, Mike? You know what they say? If they don't, if you don't get it, make it. Yeah. Make a movie. Yeah. If anybody can do it, I think it'll be you. <laughs> you, you know, before we finish off, you like to write? You did a little bit of writing? I actually have a degree in journalism. That's exactly my point, you know, and write up a script. I've been wanting to write a book. The problem is... No, a I film have... script, a movie script. Well, I want to write a book first. Okay. I feel like if I wrote a book, I could get it into the right hands to help me make it into a screenplay. It's never stopping. This man's mind is just not stopping. It's always ticking, you know. That's why about at the end of my day, like, you're more than likely going to see me sucking down some cold ones because that's the only way I can slow it down enough to be like, okay, lay down. Or I just go until I just fall over and I'm done. What do you say to people out there and other people who may have autism and they feel like they're struggling? What is a message that you want to give to them? So, my buddy Payne Man just flipped me off. <laughs> so, what I would say to people, use what you have to make it work. Like, the whole reason I don't mind the midget name and evil midget, hey, I wrote a song called Evil, and it's, I'm evil, evil as a midget can be. To me, dwarf sounds cartoony. Midget, all it means is the same thing but small. I mean, it's like I was built customized, you know? Like, and you so, were built customized, yeah. I love that, okay. Like the Cramp song, <laughs> yep. you know, which is one of my favorite bands. I mean, I've even met Jerry Lee Lewis. 
like music is a whole other thing we could go off on for hours. That's just how my life is very diverse like that. I, I figured out a way to make a name in everything I like. Everything I like, I'm in it somehow. All right. Evil Midget. Let's talk about the name, and I am going to say it loud and proud, because why not? This guy is awesome. <laughs> Tell me about the name. So, the evil part of the name is I'm actually endorsed by the Knievels to use a name. It is a trademark name on a handshake that if I profit anything over a certain amount of money, disclose them out. I owe them a percentage. Oh. I haven't reached that. That is another goal of mine is to make my brand big enough that it's a big, on a radar big enough that I go through them. I actually got a text from Kristen Knievel a while ago, which is Evil's granddaughter. And what did the text say? That my firewalls looked awesome. Wow. The first one I ever did, she sang the national anthem at it. Oh, wow. And, you know, coming back to the name Midget. So the Midget deal was just what people say. I'm an 80s kid. There's a lot of derogatory things that in our cancel culture we have now you can't say. I'm still that guy. I still say all the inappropriate words you're not supposed to. Midget being one of them. Yeah. My buddies think it's hilarious that I'll walk around basically yelling obscenities because I can get away with it. And it's not that I can get away with it, I just don't care. Okay. So it's kind of like this. Yeah. The evil midget game. One person, uh, what do they call it? Exploitation is another person's opportunity. And I love that, and you have used that to the best way that you can, because why not? If you're going to draw attention and people are going to be drawn to you, show them something to look at. Yeah. You know, and that's exactly what you've done. You know, I absolutely love it. For people out there as well, you know, don't ever be, think that to yourself that you can't achieve something. Mikey is a very, very smart man, and I just love your mind, non-stop, thinking this, trying different things. That is loud, everybody, but I'm a big believer of that. I'm somebody who's trying something different, so I hope... <laughs> <laughs> what do I expect, right? Of course, this is going to be happening. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Mike, like I said, this is why I wanted to get you on here. Give everybody an insight into a little bit about your background, a little bit about some of the hardship that you had when you were born and the way you just endured, like you passed it, you persevered through it and you achieved so much. I want that to be an inspiration for other people out there, whether they've got dwarfism or whether they've got any other kind of mental health that anyone can do it if you just have the right assistance. So Obviously, my passion's always been this motorcycle stuff that we talked about. You know, when I was born, I had club feet. Then I had three other surgeries over the next 16 years on my feet. I had a halo when I was eight. And I was the most depressed I've ever been in my life. Um, I hated everything. As soon as that was over, that was when I learned how to ride a motorcycle. And started getting into, like, driving cars and stuff. And then once I got my driver's license, I basically just stopped going to the doctor. Not the smartest thing to do, but I didn't have somebody telling me, don't do this anymore. It went to my real friends going, if you want to do this, we'll figure out a way to help you do it. So, and I actually have a doctor that I need to go see pretty soon. And uh, he's about my age, and he gets it. He's like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to help you get through so you can do it some more. So. A, a great example of mind over matter. It's 100% mind over matter. I mean, when you're staring at a flaming wall of fire on a slick floor on a motorcycle that you haven't ridden in eight years, that's 100% mind over matter because I can tell you, hitting the ground hurts a lot. I've done it. And you've got and no protection besides that helmet. <laughs> yeah, it's a helmet. <laughs> and then, uh, um, 
with that stuff that looks like thermals? Yeah. That's fire protection. Yes, it is, but it doesn't protect you from hitting the ground. Yeah, it doesn't, you still it doesn't get hurt. protect me from <laughs> hurting myself. So, it's one of those deals. I've had doctors hurt me just as much as I've hurt myself. Exactly. And there's no good story that I went and had a surgery. There's a badass story. And I went through walls of fire and hit a barrier and did all this stuff. Absolutely. You know, when I did 15 walls that you can see on YouTube, yep. I did it for uh, American Daredevils. My buddy, Mr. Dizzy, in uh, Monroe, Washington. I went down and I got a concussion and almost knocked myself out while I was on fire. When I was, like, getting my bearings back, I didn't know which way to run from the fire because it was all over me. And you're laughing about it, you're smiling about it. Now, everybody, if there's kids out there watching this, I want to make it very clear that I'm not here saying go out there and try dangerous stuff. The point of this video here, the message is that if you have a passion and you want to... When, when you've got a passion and you can have something that's going to give you the strength to get through it, no matter what it is, you've got to use it. And Mike, you've done that so well. It can be tiring at times, but hey. You're here. It's kind of one of how I know something's probably not the best idea, but going to be make me happy. If I'm totally scared of it, but get excited being scared of it, it's time to do it. It's time to do it. Yeah. Said by true adrenaline junkie. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that goes from if it's building these cars to take a chance. You know, it's a big letdown if you don't win sometimes. Or every once in a while, you don't make it in the fine nine, grade eight, whatever it be. That's a big chance. That I've watched my dad take his whole life. Sometimes we make it, sometimes we don't. Well, you'll have to get to know Steve Cook a little bit more when we do the interview about the Impala with him. But my hit has been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ray. My pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.